Hey there again, I'm Afik, and today I'm going to be talking about the courses that I took in my theoretical physics master's degree at Cambridge. Um, so as I mentioned in my last video, I did a one-year taught postgraduate course in applied maths and theoretical physics after my three-year undergraduate degree in math. And after my last video, um, people were asking to do a deep dive. So I decided to make this video to show you guys exactly what the course looks like and some of the the guidelines on the stuff that I learned. So in traditional fashion, the taught postgraduate course is kind of split into two halves concerning the theoretical physics side. The first half is the small stuff like particle physics um, and quantum field theory. And then the other side is the gravity stuff like general relativity and black holes. Um, I did both and I took a range of courses from each side and so that's what I'm gonna explain today. So I'm just on the website here and as you can see, there's quite a few things that you can take on the quantum field theory and particle physics side. I sat in on pretty much all of these in terms of lectures, but I only took four to the exam which I'll explain later. Michaelmas term is the term that happens in the winter time, so September to December. It lasts around eight weeks. And Lent term is the term after the Christmas break. East term, Easter term is typically re reserved for revision and exam. So as you can see, the first one is quantum field theory. This is probably the most important one, and it's why you learn it first, because it serves as a base for the rest, like string theory, advanced quantum field theory, and the standard model. And quantum field theory is the study of how quantum mechanics develops when you add special relativity. So the quantum mechanics that you learned in, say, like second or third year of your maths or physics degree doesn't take into account special relativity. And with those assumptions, you get a host of extra stuff. For example, you learn about about why particles can be annihilated and created and the mechanisms behind that. And you also learn about spin as well as additional things like the band structure of electrons and how that gets even more refined from the previous non-relativistic quantum theory um, formalization. Now, it's really important to note that uh, in my master's, not only is the course used to teach content, but it also teaches you ma mathematical technique. So for example, quantum field theory in the name is about field. Now, what is a field? If you think of, in your mind, uh, space, for example, it could be 3D space or 2D space, and you attach a value to every single point in space, kind of think of this like a heat map, um, that is what a field is. You're taking a point in space where space is continuous and you're mapping it to some value. Now, this value could be a solid number. For example, in this room, this point in space could be 18 degrees Celsius. This point in space could be 20 degrees Celsius, or it could be a vector. So this point in space could be related to this vector and this point in space could be related to this vector. And what quantum field theory ultimately is about is with the constraints of special relativity, you learn that these fields have to be quantized. And by quantized, it means that these fields can exist only within certain state. And quantizing up means you create particles and quantizing down means you destroy particles. So yeah, this is super useful as a mathematical formalism completely on its own. And it's actually been inspiring a really deep field of uh, mathematics. It's important to note that this is more of a framework, as I said, and these frameworks are actually put into specific theories in the later courses, which is why it's so important that you start with quantum field theory. Now, by far and large, quantum field theory as a mathematical framework has been one of the most successful theories that humankind has ever made in explaining nature. And uh, QFT has been really successful in predicting basically everything. Well, it's inspired the standard model of particle physics and it's predicted the Higgs boson and uh, all of that good stuff. So that brings us on to our second fundamental physics course, uh, symmetries, fields, and particles. So from QFT, you've now learned that particles can be modeled as field and fields while being smooth object um, can be excited into different states and these different states give rise to different particles and different energies now you might ask what does this state space look like and uh, if you have several particles in a box for example how do they interact 
And the answer to finding out what this state space looks like is basically what this course is all about. So from a previous video, I talked about group theory and uh, it turns out that groups are really, really important in understanding the mathematical structure of this state space. In particular, these state space are described as representations of group. Now, a representation of group is basically how you can write a group down in a way that respect the underlying structure of the group. For example, um, not only can you write a rotation down, a simple rotation just as an angle, you can also write it in terms of a matrix, and this matrix can be applied to vectors and rotate the vector. So a representation, it turns out, is actually a really solid way of understanding the state space of particles. And it turns out that the state space of particles are actually just different representations of an underlying group. Now, these groups have different names given by the mathematicians, like SU1, U1, SO3, um, that all have really sought different underlying principles. But at the end of the day, uh, this course is basically learning that the set of states that particles can be in depends on the underlying group that you model it with. Now, the third course is a personal favorite of mine, and it's called Statistical Field Theory. Now, Statistical Field Theory is kind of a fancy name, but the reason why I find it interesting is because it's trying to explain something that happens in every day all around us, and that is a phase transition. Now, a phase transition is when something or a physical system completely changes state in a discontinuous fashion. And this is weird, right? Because you'd expect that nothing happens discontinuously like that, especially considering most of our physical laws are written in a continuous way. In like classical mechanics, for example, things accelerate in a smooth way, velocity increases smooth way, everything is smooth. So why can you have something like ice melting or for example, um, sublimation where solids quickly turn into gases? Now. The answers to this actually have to do a lot with the math behind quantum field theory, and it turns out that quantum field theory is a great way to explain why phase transitions happen. And this is what statistical field theory is all about. Now, the first toy model that you learn is called the Ising model. And the Ising model is a famous model put forward to initially understand how magnetism works. The Ising model is what happens when you put electrons in a grid, um, like maybe like a 2D grid, and then you let them either be spin up or spin down. You then say the energy of this whole system is some expression where this expression takes into account the interactions between uh, different spins on this grid. And you basically say, what the hell happened? And it turns out a whole host of interesting stuff happened. For example, you get phase transitions where things suddenly change and you learn about critical exponents where critical exponents are the exponents that you see in physical power laws that actually occur in different types of wildly different theories but have happen to have the same exponent. So yeah, this is like a really interesting course and it was one of the things that's heavily involved in the idea of renormalization, which is something I'll get back to later on. The reason why it's called statistical field theory is because a lot of techniques and probability are fleshed out in this course and you learn a lot about how things act in ensemble or averaged out over um, many different things and these this averaging out can lead to some really weird and interesting effect now this is uh, probably the most difficult course there is um, it's called advanced quantum field theory and I took it but I didn't take the exam because it was too hard and it basically extends quantum field theory to even more physically and mathematically advanced concept. Uh, one thing that it talks about is the path integral or the Feynman path integral. Now, a path integral is basically what you get when you add up different paths uh, between states and you add them up, but you weight them for the probability or the likelihood that paths occur. And it turns out that this really beautiful formalization initially discovered by Richard Feynman helps you do loads of things in quantum field theory in an easier way. Another topic in advanced quantum field theory is the study of renormalization. And renormalization is explaining why we can do physics at all. So how come it's true that we can do classical mechanics without learning about even the smallest things in atom? For example, Newton knew how to do classical mechanics without knowing anything about quantum field theory or renormalization. And the answer to this is that things at small scales wash out. Now, by washing out, I mean that the micro doesn't affect the macro picture. And it's actually not obvious at all why this should be true, but um, it's a beautiful fact and 
this course goes more into the rigorous mathematical theory of how that works. Now, this course is where the math gets really complicated and it's kind of like your introduction to things in string theory and even like more advanced parts of condensed matter theoretical physics as well as topology and even geometry. Um, so yeah. Now, in particular, uh, in this course, Advanced Quantum Field Theory, you learn about renormalization. Now, renormalization is how the physics or the laws of physics change when you look at things with at different energy scales. Now, Advanced Quantum Field Theory is concerned a lot with the mathematics and the physics of renormalization. Renormalization is how actually the laws of physics change when you look at it from different energy scales. So for example, quantities like mass and charge actually depend a lot on what energy scale you're looking at it. So are you looking at it from a perspective of high energies? Are you looking at it perspective for low energies? And how do these change um, the quantities that you're measuring? Now, it turns out that in quantum field theory, a lot of calculations that you make, for example, uh, the momentum, the energy, or the mass of a particle, leads to infinities when you add everything up. And so how do you deal with these infinities? Well, you deal with these infinities by enforcing an energy cutoff. And that basically allows what you're adding up to converge to an actual number that you can measure. Now, this energy cutoff can vary and varying it leads to different quantities that you might be measuring it. Now, renormalization is basically a way to make sense of these infinities and it depend it basically revolves around defining things like mass and charge in a way that depends on the energy scale that you're measuring it at. The idea is that the underlying true or bare mass or charge of a particle um, is in theory not observable directly. However, the renormalized quantities that we measure at a given energy scale are the things that we are measurable. So for example, this basically tells us that a uh, physical constant, like for example, mass or charge, are not actually fixed. They actually change depend on what energy or what energy cutoff we're looking at. And this is prevalent in nature, for example, in quantum chromodynamics, which is another theory, the strong force becomes weaker at higher energy, and this is known as uh, asymptotic freedom. So it's almost as if different particles like quarks behave differently when they're really close together versus when they're far apart. Now this all leads to something called effective field theories. And effective field theories are recognizing that physics basically behaves differently at different scales. And so you get a theory tailored at specific energy scales that kind of take into account all of the higher energy phenomena and aggregates it into one thing. Now, one thing to note is that a lot of this stuff is really confusing. It's not clean and it is initially was pretty suspicious to do things like this. Um, however, the important thing is that it models the real world and it works. So fair enough, man. All right, um, so the next four courses are a bit harder as well. Uh, one of them is string theory. Now you probably have heard about string theory in popular media and popular science book. And it's basically what happens when you model particles as string instead of these fields. Now, initially the motivation behind string theory was to try to combine general relativity and quantum mechanics all in one soup to get a grand unified theory of anything. It's important to note as well that string theory is a quantum field theory itself with tweaks to the model. And uh, it starts by taking a particle, um, and instead of seeing how this particle as a dot kind of moves space-time, you view it as a string and it maps out a sheet uh, through space-time instead. And you basically ask, what kind of results does this lead to, and how can you incorporate gravity into this idea, and does it work? Uh, string theory is super controversial because, from my knowledge, nothing experimentally new has been observed here yet, uh, but it's provided a lot of inspiration to mathematicians for its geometric beauty. Now, as for the other courses, standard models, supersymmetry, and applications of quantum field theory, um, I didn't take those, so I can't tell you much. But as you know, the standard model is basically studying exactly what our best known theory of particles is. And it's written as like a really fucking large, massive group. Um, supersymmetry is another theory that's been put forward, but unfortunately we haven't seen any evidence for that yet. And um, applications of quantum field theory is actually new. So I, it wasn't around when I took this course. All right, now let's talk about the other half, which is the side about gravity. So as you can see, there are a few courses here on the gravitational side, cosmology, general relativity, 
canonical gravity, black holes, field theory and cosmology, soliton geometry, and gravitational wave. Um, I took general relativity and black holes, but I only ended up taking the exam on general relativity. And I also took uh, courses in cosmology, but I dropped out because I didn't find it interesting. So general relativity is our current best known theory of how gravity works. And if you see, if you've seen in my previous video, I basically go on about, go on about how you need a field of math called differential geometry to understand how this works. Um, general relativity is posited around mapping our world as a space called a space-time and this space-time is a manifold and a manifold is something that looks like flat space no matter where you are and general relativity is about basically how things move on this manifold by taking paths called geodesics which are the basically the path of least resistance on these certain manifolds. It's a very geometrical subject and you'll basically learn a lot here. It explains how, why, how and why black holes might form, um, what things might look like around black holes, why time dilates around black holes, um, how energy gives rise to gravity, and so on and so forth. Now, the theory of black holes is expanded even more in the actual black holes course. Something interesting to note about the black holes course is that it's super mathematical, and a lot of it is to do with mathematical analysis in geometry. For example, um, topological spaces, things more niche, like, for example, what a oh, white hole is, can you have black rings instead of black holes, and basically seeing all of like the maths around exotic spaces and what can come out of them. So more specifically, in general relativity, um, you model things as a single four-dimensional space, and this four-dimensional space consists of time on the, the first part of the vector, and three spatial dimensions. The thing that makes general relativity different from special relativity is that now you're modeling this space-time as curve. Uh, the curve, it basically tells you how things move and the curve is caused by things that have mass. So for example, if you have a sphere, a really big mass or a big massive point, how does that change the curve of space-time? And from the curve of space-time, how do you deduce the motion of object like light or solid object? For example, can light bend on a curved space? Um, does time slow down when an observer is riding on a curved space? These things are encapsulated in a theory called Einstein's field equation. And Einstein's field equation tells you how space-time is curved uh, according to the energy and momentum that are present in the space. Now, this thing is really fun because we can actually observe loads of the things that are present and been predicted by general relativity. For example, we've observed black holes, we've taken pictures of black holes, we've measured gravitational waves, taken photos of gravitational lensing. So yeah, it's really a fun topic and I suggest that uh, you read up on it if you can. Um, I'll probably make another video on textbooks that I use to learn everything here, uh, but yeah, from here on out, thanks for watching and let me know if you want me to cover anything else in the comment section.